there, fellow movie lovers. Welcome to the latest episode of Double Feature. I'm your host, Pedro, and with Halloween month upon us, it only feels appropriate to bring two horror movie recommendations. But not just two any underappreciated horror titles. Two underappreciated meta horror titles. A what? If the box office numbers of Scream 5 and 6 tell us anything, is that audiences still crave self-referential horror entries. The Scream franchise, which started in 1996, continues to push the boundaries of self-awareness and test the patience of its fans. The series has been credited for bringing the subgenre into mainstream consciousness, and its evolution has become a great example of a concept known as hyper-postmodernism, a theory first developed by the 20th century German philosopher horror movie enthusiast and sociologist Stefan von Gutenberg. Even though we all agree that Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson's creation was influential and critical to the development of metafictional horror, the fact is the seeds that allowed the genre to grow had been planted long before 1996. One of the earliest examples is Peeping Tom a British title from 1960 and a precursor to both meta-horror and found-footage subgenres. Two decades later, during the 1980s horror boom, meta-references started to become more common, with several mainstream and obscure horror titles incorporating self-aware humor and characters who reference horror movie tropes and cliches. The last horror film showcased the movie within a movie meta-angle, Friday the 13th Part 6 poked fun at the rules its predecessor had set. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 found Toby Hooper, the director of the original, mocking his own creation. And House mixed horror and comedy quite successfully, and much like Scream, inspired its own franchise. And let's not forget April Fool's Day, who duped audiences who were expecting a by-the-book pure slasher. Still, most of these titles were met with mixed box office results and polarizing critical reception. And while they're all very entertaining, and some of them are actually very good, they seem to be somewhat uneven when it comes to mixing comedy and horror, and miss the chance to really make a difference and change the game. <laughs> it's like when Warner Brothers failed to cast Francis McDormand as the Joker. The recipe for success would finally be perfected in the following decade, when Scream generated over $173 million in revenue worldwide. And so today, I'm bringing you two meta-horror gems, two movies released 11 years apart during different popularity stages of the genre, two titles that find a protagonist's love for horror movies taken a step too far. So let's get to it. Eric Benford lives for the movies. Sometimes he kills for them too. Dennis Christopher, star of Breaking Away, creates an unforgettable portrait of life on the edge of terror. Fade to black. By 1980, the slasher craze had really taken off. The formula established by Halloween two years earlier had been perfected, and now, almost every other weekend, there was a new entry, delivering guts and blood galore. In the middle of all the Friday the 13ths and Motel Hells, there was a little movie that, despite what the promotional material suggested, delivered something very different. A critical piece made by cinephiles about cinephiles that simultaneously praised and criticized an intense passion for cinema. In Fade to Black, we follow Eric Benford, played by Dennis Christopher, a young and socially awkward film enthusiast who works at a film distribution warehouse in Los Angeles. Mentally, Eric is as stable as the Silicon Valley Bank. As a way of coping with his loneliness, he has developed an obsession with classic Hollywood films, and spends his free time watching movies and studying his favorite actors. 
Because of his eccentric personality and odd behaviors, Eric is bullied at home by his aunt, and he's the favorite target of his co-worker Richie, played by a young Mickey Rourke. Eric's best defense against his tormentors is his seemingly infinite collection of useless movie trivia. But you didn't know what Adolf Hitler's favorite movie was, Broadway Melody, I bet you didn't know that. But what about Cry of Battle and War as Hell? Where were they playing, huh? At the Texas theater where they caught Oswald the day shot Kennedy. I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> Completely unrelatable. Later on, he meets and falls in love with a Marilyn Monroe lookalike named, uh, Marilyn? She proves to be the straw that broke the camel's back after she unintentionally studs him up for a date. Eric is pushed to a limit and goes on a killing rampage. He disposes of his victims by reenacting scenes from his favorite movies. And it's at this stage that we see Binford completely out of touch with reality, as he proceeds to act like a letterboxed user with over 3,000 movie entries writing funny movie reviews for likes. The references to old classic movies are what separates Fate to Black from later genre entries such as Scream. Eric takes inspiration from different personas, from sources other than horror. He embodies James Cagney's Cody Jarrett from White Heat, Hopalong Cassidy, The Mummy, and perhaps the scariest of them all, Paul Blart Molkov. The main flaw that prevents this movie from achieving a status of excellence is the absence of ambiguity. For example, there's this minor plotline centered on a sleazy filmmaker named Gary Something, who Eric believes have stolen his movie idea. I think this plotline could have been better explored by having our lead take the role of an unreliable narrator and further contribute to Eric's loss of grip on reality. Overall, Fade to Black is a carefully executed psychological thriller that not only pays an obvious homage to Alfred Hitchcock, but also ranks up there with some of Brian De Palma's best movies. A great metafiction work and a chilling portrait of the dangers of obsession and the blurred lines between reality and fantasy that will appeal to horror and non-horror fans alike. This one gets a thumbs up from me. Before the horror of Halloween. Before the fear of Friday the 13th. Before the evil of a nightmare on Elm Street. Before them all, there was popcorn. Buy a bag. Go home in a box. Like any other major trend that dominated the 1980s cultural landscape, slashers had fallen out of fashion by the early 1990s, having been replaced by more sophisticated, adult-oriented thrillers. By the time Popcorn was released in 1991, the leading three franchises had run out of steam and studios were adamant about greenlighting new genre projects. In a way, both Popcorn and Universal Studios back Dr. Giggles, released in 1992, were the last two titles that bookended the horror cycle that had dominated the previous decade. In Popcorn, we follow a group of film students who decide to put on a horror movie festival as a fundraiser. Maggie, the main protagonist, is passionate about horror movies and has a troubled past. As the marathon begins, she and her friends notice that a man in a mask is stalking them. They assume it's just a prank, until they discover that the mask is from the movie they are currently showing. Things take a deadly turn when a mysterious killer begins targeting the students and mimicking the deaths in the horror movies being shown. Now I may be channeling Stefan here, but Popcorn is certainly a movie with something for everyone. This place has everything. There's a tribute to the 1950s William Castle B movies with titles such as Mosquito, The Attack of the Amazing Electrified Man, and The Stench being featured in this film, the meta-ominous plotline about a film director who went insane and murdered his family, cheesy and absurd dialogue lines, and a death sequence involving an exploding toilet, an obvious nod to the movie's silent financial backer, Taco Bell. 
Regarding the movie's subplot around Lanyard Gates, the cult leader and director of the fictional movie Possessor, not to be confused with Brandon Cronenberg's movie, there was a lot more the director could have done. Instead, Popcorn simply links Maggie and her horror movie obsession with Possessor and moves on before resurrecting the movie's plot during the third act's major reveal. Of course, the movie's main attraction is a killer who literally becomes somebody else as he quickly creates face masks out of the victims he disposed of. You can safely assume that Popcorn inspired the gimmick that would become a cornerstone of the Mission Impossible franchise and influenced face-off director and regular moviegoer John Woo, seen here as he queues up for a matinee of Breaking 2 Electric Boogaloo. When compared with Fate to Black, Popcorn is more of a light-hearted and campy horror film that parodies the slasher movies of the 1980s. Both films feature a protagonist who becomes obsessed with horror movies and begins to reenact scenes from them in violent and dangerous ways, but this 1990s entry certainly refuses to take itself too seriously. Take, for instance, the sequence in which Dee Wallace's character experiences a zany event that seems straight out of A Nightmare on Elm Street. This scene features a supernatural event that's completely detached from the movie's tone and theme. Then there's also the off-putting reggae-based soundtrack that exists solely because the whole production took place in Jamaica. Certainly not a deal-breaker, but hmm, one of the most unusual score choices since Harry Manfredini's disco-infused score from Friday the 13th Part 3. There are other inconsistencies and continuity errors that can be attributed to a troubled production, something that's perfectly captured in the movie's title. Although an element in the story, Popcorn, was originally linked to the title and the plot before it was completely removed in the final cut. However, the producers and distributors were fond of the title and decided to keep it anyway, even though there was no connection between the actual Popcorn, the plot, and the title. When all is said and done, Popcorn isn't a landmark slasher movie, but it's certainly a great example of a fun 1980s horror movie. During the whole 90-minute duration of the movie, you can simply switch off your brain and enjoy this metafiction entry that, though forgotten, certainly paved the way for better things to come. Just two years after this movie's released, Joe Dante's Dramedy would explore some of Popcorn's influences and cover common ground namely William Castle's gimmicky movies. Though it's not a horror movie, I highly recommend it, and, well, if you have time and want a breeder between two horror movies, why not put this one in? Once again, I'm Pedro from Vinyl and Celluloid, here on Double Feature. Thanks for watching, and if you're interested in finding out my thoughts on other movies, you can go over to my letterbox page, where you can find over 230 movie reviews penned by yours truly. Until next time... Keep the reels rolling.